Welcome everyone to another discussion with uh, experts in the digital and online teaching and learning space. Today we're privileged to spend some time talking to uh, Sasha Poquet, who has terrific expertise in the digital experience related to social dynamics, social learning, social networks, peer effects, and a range of concepts that are critical in online environments. The online environment is often viewed to be less social and less interactive than the physical space, but I think some of the comments that Sasha will share with us will challenge that or question that at least slightly. Sasha, quick introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Um, hi, thanks for the introduction, George. So my name is Sasha Poquet, and I'm a researcher at the Center for Change and Complexity uh, in Learning at the University of South Australia. And um, true, I, what, what I do is that um, my research and my work um, with, related to digital learning sits within the social part of the socio-technical systems. Um, so what I look at normally in my research is, um, if you think about the digital learning, what, 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 what is digital learning? I mean, digital learning is basically, you have learners who have their individual learning behaviors and something that they do produces and starts and situates them in the learning processes. The trick or, or something that I discovered very early on as I started working with this area was that um, digital learning is situated within socio-technical systems. And what that means is that you have a social system that relates to some kind of social context wh where the learners are learning, as well as a technical system which relates to the affordances of the technologies. So, um, Zoom, Skype, um, an online platform where you post your comments, a text, all of these things are technological affordances, right? But your class, uh, group activities, individual learning, all of these are sort of different kinds of social arrangements with where digital learning takes place. So I'm interested in the social part of the socio-technical system. Um, that's uh, roughly what I do. So and that's a terrific uh, area of uh, focus, and it's an, and I like the way you introduce that is that you have these social technical spaces, and you know the technology environments such as Zoom, where we're doing the video now, were very prominent early on with distance learning and distance education was threaded discussions, and in mid two thousands everybody was all a flutter about Web two point and the social affordances of this medium and so on. So ultimately, it's really about us connecting with other people with technology as an agent that enables that but it produces something that I know you focus on quite a bit which is the idea of peer effects can you talk more about what that means right so thank you George for also putting a little bit of the historic context on the area of uh, on the area of social interactions because um, as you have pointed out, people often forget that learning is socially situated and it's extremely prominent when you look at all the theory and all the sort of practical advice that has been given to digital learning uh, practitioners over time, over the last uh, years. Specifically, uh, this idea of transactional distance that needs to be bridged uh, between the learners using different kind of pedagogical um, devices. Um, such as if you, for instance, if you and I interact um, rather frequently uh, in a course and you as an instructor provide me feedback, you, develop, you can develop so-called teaching presence, right? And so you can have an effect on me in the same way as people have effects on one another in a face-to-face -face space. Um, and, and this idea of effect of one person or another is not new. Um, I mean, a lot of educational philosophies are based on the idea that our learning, our deep learning is rooted in uh, sort of relationships that are established between people. So, I mean, even humanistic pedagogies of Rogers, right? We're looking at authentic relationships that help people develop. But in online spaces, we have a lot more um, things to play with, so to speak, with peer effects. Um, and um, so that's, that, that's why I'm interested in it because very often people forget that by having all sorts of social interactions in a learning environment online, learners can be exposed to new things and can engage in building new things themselves. And those are not necessarily the same um, thing. I mean, to, I'll give an example because I feel like this is a bit too vague. So as simple as having a video where two people talk to one another, where an expert and a novice are discussing a problem, 
can elicit a peer effect in a viewer that has been shown um, in research on effects of video because it triggers cognitive conflict in a viewer. So lurking, a learning in lurkers who just sort of look at what the others are doing is an effect, um, is a peer effect. Uh, but then there are other more explicit forms of learning from others, such as participating in a community of inquiry, which is another theoretical framework um, that is present in online education, where uh, learners can see how others are building discourse and uh, or what are the norms and rules of being a professional in an online space in this instance. So I hope this exemplifies a little bit what I'm uh, interested in. It, it really does. And, and I, it relates to another key point that I know you have a great deal of interest in as well, which is when you're involved and, and you know, Chris Stackies and others have, have addressed sort of the social network influences on a range of factors, such as our health, you know, the, the types of people we interact with often has, has somewhat of a relationship to, to our own health, our own diet, our own physical activity. So there are dynamics that are driven by social systems that are often not appreciated the degree to which they actually have an impact. And maybe it's that old statement that, that some of the, the viewers or listeners might have heard from, from say their parents that say, you know, you don't hang out with this, you know, a, a bad apple can spoil the whole batch kind of a thing. And it really is true that the, the, the way you interact with systems and the type of people that you're involved with uh, influence yourself. And that holds true, say, in the kinds of conversations that you're a part of. And when educators want to promote engaging deep levels of dialogue between students in online settings, they're participating in lack of a better word, a complex system, a complex social system to be more accurate. And as I mentioned, that's I know an area where you have a great degree of expertise and, and knowledge as well. What is a complex social system from a learning lens? It's a very good question. Thank you. I don't think I have a, nice and contained answer to that, but I'd like to, I mean, a, a complex system is a system that consists of many parts and they interact into an extent that neither of them together, if you just combine them, will equal what the complex system altogether does. So it's sort of the sum is not a whole of, what is it? Adding all the parts is not what the totality of them actually is in a complex system. But I'll give a more concrete example because there are so many, uh, is specifically to the social learning. So one of my, um, my early research focused on understanding MOOCs and communities in MOOCs. And it is because people coming from teaching online courses, university courses, there's a great deal of research and theory as to how that develops. And a lot of it rests upon the formation of communities. Um, and um, a lot of critique to the MOOC spaces, be that whether they're distributed, such as connectivist MOOCs, or using a lot of technologies and then tying the learners that are acting in different spaces together in some kind of channel, or whether it's a centralized MOOC where you have a forum and everybody's posting. Regardless, um, people would critique either by saying that there is not enough. Uh, of conventional community that they would observe in the courses before. And that really um, puzzled me at that point because when I would look at the interactions in MOOCs, I would see that there are markers of community that are present, but the dynamics overall of what's happening is different. And so you know that very well as one of the sort of people behind a more progressive um, pedagogies um, of MOOCs that open learning, learning in open spaces or learning socially in open ended uh, sort of uh, technical environments is not limited to community. In other words, it means that there is a network within the community is developing. And so you would have a community within a network that would have certain constraints and restrictions that you would expect in in a class, if you have a class and meet together and people have shared interests and they know one another, they develop social presence, and, um, they uh, sort of have certain familiarity and trust in each other, there are norms that they're learning from one another. So all of that is situated within the network of these other diversity of ideas and people with different agendas who are coming in and out. But that together is a two level system, for example, it's a system that uh, has different uh, processes and different time scales. So information exchange happens at one pace and the, the relationship development happens at another scale. And so if you're an instructor and you're teaching an online course, I would say 
how does that translate into practice? I mean, all of this is very interesting, but so what are we supposed to do about it? We should think about the different levels of the systems and parts of the system and deciding what, who should we cater to? Who matters more to me as an instructor? Do I want to promote the material that I'm teaching to anybody and everybody? Or do I actually want to promote some professional values and have people build relationships that they will uh, foster further on? I mean, it's just putting your priorities as to what your focus is then requires decisions that you make pedagogically but it doesn't mean that by putting your focus on one part the other part will just disappear it will still be there because it's still a complex system that has all, all these different parts coming together yeah yeah that, that's a good explanation and and uh and i think that sort of moves into uh the, the final question i'll direct toward you but uh, just before i i get there I, I just want to reflect a little bit on what you were sharing around sort of the nature of these systems and the way that the systems function, because in many ways, when you move online, there's a significant power shift that occurs. And that power shift is a number of factors that are at play. First of all, technology plays a role, the types of resources you have and so on. But one of the biggest things that I've noticed is people have more control. And by people, I mean the students. And it also at some level, alleviates the need for the instructor to be sort of the sole instructor in a course. And I've found uh, in many courses, you, you can end up with students playing very active teaching, mentoring roles for one another. We all have a different level of knowledge. And as we partake in these environments, we can, through simple answers, clarify responses that someone can ask and, and you know, help foster that role of collaboration and engagement. And that's something I'd really encourage for uh, anyone that's taking this course in particular to focus on how can you activate sort of the latent knowledge capability of your student population by encouraging them to become more active in answering one another questions creating artifacts and the list goes on so it becomes for lack of a better word a co-teaching system um, but the final question that I have for you Sasha relates to there's a lot of teachers around the world uh, faculty support staff profs uh, even administrators people in the k-12 system that are now faced with a need to rapidly get online and clearly that's a daunting and an overwhelming challenge based on the nature of your research and of your, you know, the work that you've done and you know, coming out of your own PhD work, what kind of advice would you give people who have limited familiarity with the online environment as a medium for teaching? Thank you, George. It's a, a very big question. Um, I think I want to first tag something back to the previous comment you made where you talked about co-teaching situation and so some evidence and some of the research that I've done with colleagues gives evidence of those things that you've mentioned where it's good to involve your students. So for instance I have seen in my work and my research that uh, if a facilitator in a social interaction space is overly active um, then the communities are underdeveloped. In other words if you think about it Simply think of a situation where you have a few people at the table and there's one person who talks a lot in other ways taking space from others to step in and do that. And so we've seen that in basically log data and temporal analyses of how the active instructor can phase out letting students come in. And also I think sometimes it's about letting go of control, which is hard if you've only done face-to-face -face teaching. In an online environment, it's really nerve-wracking. How do you stop talking and convince yourself that it may actually be worth doing? And so my advice there would be that working with artifacts and sort of some of the connectivist, very uh, sort of basic scaffold techniques are very useful I think in letting go of control because you're giving control to students by producing the artifacts and then just guiding the discourse when they're sharing so I think that that's a very sort of practical advice of how to make this shift from having a teacher's authority in nurturing discourse and community because it, the autonomy that the learners have or should gain is very important but otherwise, in terms of the advice that I've had um, in my work, and I think it's been continuous. So as a researcher, I work with indicators of learning. And the question that we get very often is, well, what's good? Can you tell us what is the indicator of a good social learning situation? And my answer to that has been very similar to the one I'm going to give to your question right now, which is there are different types of pros 
disease that you may want to choose to foster. My indicators would differ depending on what you choose to foster because not all the good stuff that you want to see in a social environment will happen at the same time. So vicarious learning, so observing somebody having a rich conversation is one thing you may want to focus on. And that, wouldn't, that would mean ignoring all the lurkers. So that would mean not involving everybody, but involving only people who are capable of having deep discourse, but then you're focusing on having everybody else watch that deep discourse, right? Or you can choose to focus on community development. And that would be from practical, so what my research suggests is that having people be unhappy about something or really happy about something may be a good thing besides their shared interests because then they negotiate the truth, their own truth in relation to that, those things that they emotionally attach. And so that interest creates a shared space for them to develop their own community over time and norms and interests. Uh, so that would be towards community development, social presence there would matter, teaching presence would matter to an extent. But then if you focus on community development, you may not be as sort of heavily focused on discourse development. Um, and because, for instance, you may want to foster deeper conversations and sort of work more on cognitive presence element. And um, for that, you can use scaffolds and exemplars, and there's plenty of literature that suggests that what I'm trying to say is that as an instructor, just like you go into your own nor your normal teaching situation, you plan what you want social interactions to achieve. And then you work backwards as to what technology you have, what your tasks are, and what kind of social context your learners have. And you, you just map your what you want to achieve back to what you have and see whether there is a discrepancy between that. So that would be my very practical down to earth view of that. But of course, I, I mean, the, the, the sort of the templates are, I think connectivist teaching practices are uh, exemplary in fostering communities and relationships. There's nothing that beats that because it strikes a very nice balance. But no, it's not obligatory that everybody should be doing that. People can be choosing just elements of that um, pedagogy, so to speak, that work with their personalities. So I think that's how I uh, think about it. I'm not sure whether all of the, whether many people would agree or disagree, but that's my view on all of this based on yeah, and I think that's a nice way to wrap things up regarding the critical need for us to be aware that there's no canned response to how a teacher will teach online. It's going to be a function of what kinds of technologies does your university make available to its uh, faculty or to its students. There's going to be questions around the nature of the topic. So, for example, uh, just today on Twitter, I saw Stephen Strogatz, who's a you know, well-known uh, mathematician. I think he's out of Cornell. can't even remember now, but he tweeted. He's like, I, you know, I need to show uh, my students formulas, and how do I do this online? And, uh, and it was nice to see a couple of quick responses, which is a great example of peer learning. One said, you know, use, uh, if you have a whiteboard, use an iPad and use Zoom's whiteboard for you to be able to record you know, draw out your formulas and, or you can use a document camera. Now, of course, in both instances, these aren't cheap, like a document camera is $300 and an iPad can be, uh, you know, six, $700. But the, the point trying to get across was the domain matters, not just your expert, the technology the university has available matters. The domain in which you're teaching matters. The kinds of technology that you have available personally when you're quarantined at home, that also matters. Your students, and the list goes on and on. So you're really going through this, almost this, this complex exercise, as you noted, of mapping your intentions, your learning goals, your outcomes with a range of factors that require you to have to be flexible and adaptive based on exactly what your unique dynamics are. Uh, so on that note, uh, Dr. Sasha Poquet, thank you for taking the time to share your insight with us. I think these are critical things that uh, it's good to know uh, the significance of the research base that it is already developing in social learning and digital environments. And, and I think there's a lot of value for faculty as they move into this environment to realize that you can make it a rich and effective experience, but you need to consider a number of variables that you've ably identified. So thanks again. Thank you.